Digital Theater Systems is one company that helped revolutionize the movie-going experience with digital sound in the early 1990s. But the discoveries, headaches, and breakthroughs cataloging the process from here Mega movie Jurassic Park is more than just a visual experience. Those who sat through it with their eyes shut can tell you the soundtrack can be terrifying as well. To hear have largely been untold. To help tell the story of the company's early days are one of Digital Theater System's founding members, Bill Neighbors, and longtime sound engineer for DTS, Brian Slack. This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN allows you to stream content that is geo-blocked in different countries while simultaneously keeping your information safe. They've got over 3,000 servers in nearly 100 countries allowing you freedom of movement while keeping your identity and your internet connected devices safe. Use the link in the description below to support Movie University and receive 3 months for free when you purchase a 12 month subscription. Seeing this little logo on products can now be taken for granted, but the early years of the company were anything but uneventful. To help give some context of how DTS began in the 90s, you have to go back a few decades to know how surround sound started out. The first documented use of surround sound was actually in 1940 by Walt Disney for Fantasia. This format would end up being called Fantasound, and it utilized five speakers with two audio tracks on it. Due to the cost of the initial setup of the system, an overwhelming majority of theaters opted to not buy Fantasound, and instead kept the mono sound system that was popular at the time. During the 50s, movie companies experimented a great deal with widescreen formats. This created the need to have wider sound environments to better encapsulate the audience. Breakthroughs for on-screen presentations eventually brought with it interest in improved sound and gave way to stereo and quadraphonic sound formats. To learn more about the evolution of widescreen and screen ratios, check out this video I did on the topic not too long ago after this one in the description below. In 1975, Dolby began offering a new stereo playback system that could produce four channels of sound from a film's photographically printed soundtrack. The big boost for surround sound came with a single release, 1977's Star Wars A New Hope, with its swooping rear channel effects. The success of Star Wars inspired theater owners to upgrade their sound equipment to the Dolby Stereo standard and led to other producers and studios embracing the surround sound format. Fast forward some years and surround sound was furthered by Sony creating the Sony Dynamic Digital Sound 7.1 system and Dolby cementing the now standard 5.1 setup with its then AC3 file codec on Laserdisc releases. While more speakers in more places adds to a level of immersion for the audience, these upgrades in speaker numbers often downgraded the overall quality of the audio being played because of the compression involved to fit the audio tracks onto the film stock. Frustrated at the lack of audio quality, two friends teamed together to create digital theater systems known to most of us now as DTS. Why digital over analog though? Digital audio that converted sound into computer code offered better sound reproduction. This was because the sound could be copied and played back without the generational loss in background noise associated with analog sound. Because film prints are subject to wear and tear during projection, they would eventually render digital information unreadable. Craving a better audio experience, Terry Beer and Jim Ketchum decided to create a system that used a separate data storage medium. 
it would be synchronized to the film via a time code printed at the unused edge of the soundtrack area. The two settled on CD-ROM discs, which were capable of quick resynchronization if needed, and, more importantly, were cheap to produce. Beard had earlier run a company called New Optics that made optical sound recording equipment. In the mid-1980s, he and Ketchum had begun developing digital multi-channel sound for use in theaters. By 1990, they had created a workable system and were ready to pitch it to a company. One of the genius things that Terry Beard did was um, uh, he had run for many years a very successful company called New Optics, which pretty much was the industry standard in optical soundtrack electronics. So if you were making soundtracks pretty much anywhere in the world, you probably had new optics electronics in it. So if there was one guy who knew everything there was to know about 35 millimeter film and the specs behind it, it was Terry. So one of the things he realized was there was a tiny bit of space between the optical soundtrack and the picture that had never been designated for any use. It was just filler space, just a buffer between the picture and the soundtrack so that you didn't hear the picture when you know you were playing back your soundtrack and you didn't see the soundtrack when you were playing back your your picture um so he said well you know we can use that for something so the uh, one of the other inventors uh, uh one of the engineers jim ketchum had i believe jim had already won a technical academy award for his synchronization systems so he had developed a synchronization system for post facilities to synchronize the 35 millimeter mag machines and pretty much all mixing was done using his technology so if there was a guy who knew anything about synchronization and time code it was jim ketchum so the two of them worked together to come up with this format and jim ketchum designed a simple, robust, rudimentary time code that would fit in that little spot. And that's what that is. So that time code is custom to DTS and uh, uh, it has just enough information so that you don't play the wrong disc at the, over the wrong movie. It has a serial number, it has some security built in, it's very robust. Um, uh, even if the time code drops out or gets damaged in some way for fairly long period of time, called a second or a couple seconds, the system would still continue to play until it captured time code again. So it was incredibly robust. Um, and one of the things they decided was to go with a dual system digital sound system, which means that the time code was on the film, but the audio wasn't. So what they did was they used CDs, literally just off the shelf CDs, and they encoded it with, uh, uh, with some data compression so that they could get the six channels onto the CDs. And those CDs would synchronize with the time code. And that was one of the major patents that DTS got was on that whole system of synchronizing um, CDs with uh, a, let's call it a, a, uh, a variable source. <laughs> so 30, 35 millimeter film in theaters is not exactly a precision device. Many of them were installed in the 50s. So, you know, so we were playing back six track digital sound on projectors many times that were 40, 50, 60 years old. You know, so getting them to run at precisely 24 frames a second was just not going to happen. So that was one of the big breakthroughs that they came through for DTS was not just the robustness of the time code, the quality of the soundtrack, the ease and expense of making the CDs themselves, but also the quality and be able to like synchronize with basically any projector. So it was like Bill says, it was for its time really truly revolutionary. It wasn't just playing back six tracks of audio in a movie theater was everything that went into it to make that possible. The, the competitors, God bless them, were trying to do something much more difficult, frankly. Mm -hmm. Trying to print through with, with 35 millimeter chemical emulsion, digital data between the sprocket holes. And as you know, digital is digital. It's on or it's off. And so the, the time code that you see, you can hold up to the light and see it uh, for the DTS track was gigantic in comparison. So uh, it, the tolerances for, in the film lab were, you know, were not tested like they were for digital. So for instance, so we had a virtually 100%, a 99.9% accepting rate out of the lab. In 1991, Beard had a meeting with director Steven Spielberg and showed him his DTS mix of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Spielberg was so impressed 
he said on the spot he wanted his next movie mixed in the format. In February of 93, the order for Universal came through to have DTS installed in hundreds of theaters. This large order dwarfed competitors Dolby Labs and Sony, who had digital systems in around 250 theaters combined worldwide at the time. Beard and his small staff, which included Bill, immediately began working long hours to build playback units for hundreds of theaters in preparation for the June 11th opening of Jurassic Park. They were able to complete 876 systems that were installed around the United States by the film's opening day. A quality presentation should be ubiquitous. A quality presentation should, it can't just be for six theaters in New York and five in, in Los Angeles and two in Chicago and Paris. You know, this should, you know, some, when uh, some high profile director spends time and money telling the story, everybody should be able to have the best experience. And therefore this was designed for, because it was very engineering robust and it was very economic for cinema owners to upgrade. And that's why we just took off. I mean, our, we started the company in January, opened on June 11th that same year on, I always forget the number, 867 screens, 875, 800 and some screens, which was three times the combined install base of the two other companies had done the previous two years. But saying you want that much audio equipment made and shipped is easier said than done. They didn't even have, there was no blueprints, there was no reference designators for the circuit boards. Um, there, was, there was no parts list. These things were hand built. First thing I did is we literally had to re in, reverse engineer our own product to come up with parts lists and, and ref des and everything else to build um, you know, quantity production shipments to ship around the, the country and around the world. The purchase from Universal caused waves in the industry at the time. At stake here is the defining movie experience for the next decade in the nation's 25,000 theaters. Film technology has been slow to adopt the benefits of digital music, the same pristine sound one enjoys at home with a compact disc player. Jurassic Park opened to critical and commercial success, and the sound quality wasn't lost on viewers or the media. The digital synclavier loaded with megabytes of animal sounds allowed sound designer Gary Rydstrom to play the dinosaur sounds along with the film like an instrumental performance. One major thing DTS had going for its rapid adoption was the introductory price. For less than $6,000, the theater would be ready to go with an existing speaker configuration currently in theater auditoriums and with minimal installation requirements for the equipment needed in the projection booth. DTS's competitors were not going to go away quietly. Dolby Labs, which put its digital soundtrack between the film's sprockets, saw DTS as flawed since it required the film to constantly communicate with the CD. In other words, they didn't like that it needed two pieces to display the one movie. Their system is an interlock versus ours being on the film. Interlock doesn't work in the long run. You have to ship the film and the CD. What happens if the other media breaks or doesn't get there? You're back to analog. After a couple of years, DTS began to shift its focus from the cinema market and expand it into the home theater. The shift to the home market gained a dedicated following from home movie enthusiasts because of the quality of the audio files coming from DTS. With surround sound, the user ends up enjoying more channels as well as a higher quality loudness factor to the audio being presented. However, in the early days, there was a lot of sound engineering discovery going on to make sure the loudness of the systems did not distort the movies they were playing. Sound quality at home has vastly improved over the last 30 years to the point where the viewing experience at home is better in a lot of cases than going to a theater. But even now, the codec for DTS in your home and the one in the theater are different. In the very early days, um, uh, and I won't speak to our competitors' methods or how they're doing it, but um, but they had, for the most part, like reused their technology for their professional and theatrical markets in the home market. Whereas the DTS product, um, Coherent Acoustic, um, was not the same codec that we were using in the home that we were using in the theaters. You know, it was obviously the same guys who designed it and so on, but they took all the stuff that they learned from the theatrical and designed an entirely new codec just for uh, the home. And one of the, again, one of the genius things they did with uh, DTS, with that codec early on with Coherent Acoustic, was they always designed it to be extensible, meaning that 
they always planned on it being able to do other things. So the first codec would do stereo and 5.1 and whatever was around, but they would do, well, eventually maybe we'll want more channels. Maybe we'll want to do other things. So one of the early things they did was there was DTS-ES, which was 6.1. So you had a center surround channel. And that was simply added onto the codec, you know, so that the original codec, so if you had a DTS-ES disc, you could play it back in a DTS-ES receiver and you'd get all 6.1 channels. But if you took that exact same disc and played it back in an original DTS player in 5.1, it would play back just fine. Okay. Then they added on other data. So now we start getting into the land of lossless compression. You know, where there is no artifacts. You know, whatever you put in is exactly what you get out. Now, obviously, the files are much bigger, but it is a bit for bit representation of what you put into it. So, everyone, like in music and high fidelity, you know, they love that. So, what they did with DTS is they simply added on the extra data that they needed to make it lossless. So now, same thing. It's called DTS Master Audio. So you take a DTS Master Audio disc, you play it back in a DTS player that understands it, and you get completely lossless, perfect, 5.1, 7.1, whatever it is you want off of it. But if you take that same disc and you have a receiver that you bought in 1998 to play back the Matrix, well, it's gonna play back just fine as well. It's not going to be lossless, but it will play back exactly like it originally would. And we call that the core, that a coherent acoustic uh, data compression is called the core. And then you go up to DTSX, where you now have immersive. So now you've got 7.1 and 714 and 914 and all these other lane objects on there. Same thing is true. All we did was we added on the data that we needed to make it immersive. But you can still take that disc and play it back in a receiver from 1994, or 1998 rather, and it'll st still play back in 5.1 exactly like it would have in 1998. So that was sort of like one of the primary and differentiating design features of DTS was not only the ability to do high quality, but the ability to be completely backwards compatible back to the original players. As the 2000s wore on, DTS expanded its reach. It acquired high-end audio playback equipment company Merritt's and bought HD Radio. They even signed a deal with Acura in 2003 to put DTS in the TL model and a similar deal with Mitsubishi in 2012. The premium eight speaker sound system with iPod integration, it's meant to be heard. Today, DTS continues to pioneer new methods of giving customers the best possible audio experience. What do you guys think about DTS? Did you hear about them years ago? Have you followed them over the years? Tell me your experiences with DTS in the comment section below. This is Movie University, Education in Cinema.